on uh, OpenJDK performance primarily. Uh, so I've been doing a little bit over the last couple of years some tuning of our um, of of startup of the base OpenJDK uh, experience. Before I start lying, I have to show you this one, and then let's let's go. So the startup challenges that we experience as uh, as Java users and and JVM developers are manifold. And uh, the OpenJDK is optimized for uh, peak performance. And uh, recently with ZGC and others, you know, uh, uh, low, low latency. And uh, startup and footprint has always been these uh, kind of nice to have things uh, that you kind of expect in client settings, but the client VM has been uh, drifting away from uh, from OpenJDK uh, interest for some time. So startup is something that is often draw, uh, drawing the shortest straw when it comes to what to optimize, what to uh, fix for. And uh, the nature of the beast then is that you're adding features, you're adding uh, new new cool things that optimize, you, you make you make optimization to C2, you make optimization to some library, it adds bloat, it adds, you know, death by a thousand cut uh, to, to the OpenJDK experience. So um, over six, seven, eight, and especially in maybe nine, you've seen, you know, small, small additions of um, little, little things that are getting run at startup or every time you bootstrap some, something that adds, you know, you, you typically don't see, see them, but they do add up over time. Also, in the recent, almost saying decades, but years, uh, we've been adding more and more uh, dynamic setup things. Uh, Don Hiding, I was here talking about uh, Indy and Condi earlier, and that's kind of the trend that we are on to use dynamic bootstraps for more and more things. And those things, well, they're not for free, especially not for uh, from a startup point of view, uh, also for from a footprint point of view. So. Uh, and we're going to add more of those, probably. Uh, so how do we deal with that uh, that conundrum to, to kind of try and keep at least startup stable or improving over time without blocking uh, nice feature improvements using uh, Indie and other features? So, well, before you <laughs> before you optimize anything, you have to ask yourself why uh, why bother. Well, there's been a there's been a range of interests in, in making Java faster uh, to start up uh, and anything from people you know picking up languages just to write some CLI tool or your uh, your function as a service uh, uh, vendor wants to uh, cut a few mi milliseconds off of your uh, service times when you're bootstrapping a new VM every time you're servicing a request which seems a little bit high on the overhead side uh, and of course, you have, you know, legacy efforts in the OpenJDK community. You have uh, embedded and client VMs, etc. And we're mostly focusing on on the server uh, VM today. So, how do we make the server VM uh, encompass and you know accommodate some of the use cases previously done in different uh, optimization, uh, different repositories? Well, and you know, the other reasons are more uh, uh, maybe. Personal, I like to keep fighting the misconception that Java is slow, and I like to improve the quality of life of my own uh, development experience. You know, every every ten millisecond we can cut away from startup makes you know our testing environment run half an hour faster. Uh, so that there's that. When it comes to s startup techniques, there are a lot of high-level things that have been uh, you know featureized uh, over the years. Uh, going way back, you have uh, class data sharing CDS. Uh, it was incepted back in in the client VM, mostly first implemented for Windows to to make applets start faster. Uh, why is it still a thing? Well, someone realized that oh, we can we can adapt this and use this on server class VMs, um, expand it to include the application application classes themselves. Uh, so it was kind of built as a commercial feature for. Uh, 
for Oracle VMs to support WebLogic servers with application class data sharing, and then as a commercial feature, open sourced fully in Java 11. So now we can use uh, application class data sharing, and it's kind of cool. You you add it, um, run it for your application, and it can cut up to 50% of your startup if you're lucky. Your mileage may vary. Uh, the AUT effort in Java 9 added uh, an experimental um, exper experimental ahead of time compiler uh, coming out of the Graal uh, effort. So it's a Graal based compiler shipped with OpenEDK that allows you to pre compile your Java classes to an A AUT shared library, uh, which uh, has a little bit of a mixed, mixed bag of uh, results. Um, but the, the benefit is your AUT archives are loaded in and it doesn't really affect your application other than that. It adds uh, end methods to whatever to your code cache, but then, well, the peak performance uh, won't regress too much, but I'm not going to talk much about uh, AUT. Um, and then there are other more intrusive uh, and experimental uh, features like the uh, well, what you can do with JLink to uh, cut away things from your runtime images uh, or compress them or do other things uh, basically uh, enables to write plugins to that would do that could theoretically do a lot of the things that you are doing today with with agents, but you can do them uh, ahead of time in as a JLink uh, pipeline. Uh, so it's something that links. Uh, your e image ahead of time. So if you're shipping an uh, image, you can do that ahead of time. Um, native image uh, is also something that is on the radar, but it's not included in this talk. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a Graal VM effort to uh, uh, compile your Java application down into, with closed world assumptions, uh, down to a single binary, so it kind of cuts most of the JVM <laughs> out of the picture and gives you a uh, uh, runtime image. So the efforts in this is uh, is out of scope for uh, for this talk, but it's it's fun things to uh, to look at if you're really just looking for something that starts fast, runs with a minimal binary size and such. But I'm well not looking at those things right now. I'm more looking from a perspective of you know. Open JDK. How do we make Java as as every, everyone knows it start a little bit faster? Because reasons. Uh, so I usually start with uh, well, uh, with Hello World, which is uh, <laughs> everyone's favorite startup microbenchmark since uh, since at least '95. Uh, and when it comes to uh, well, what do you mean with startup? It's a little bit ill-defined. Uh, but most most people kind of they run Hello World and they uh, they clock it with uh, with use of bin time or whatever, and say like, "Oh, my JVM started in 100 milliseconds." Well, it didn't only start; it uh, it also ran its course and then uh, it shut everything down, and all those uh, you know uh, handoffs and synchronizations with the OS adds a lot of time, depending on. Uh, for example, if your concurrent GC cycle has already started, then G1 or whichever collector you're running might be blocking for for some some level of uh, some amount of time. So, if you're really wanting to uh, measure startup, you should have some way to, well, maybe some external tool that uh, recognizes when your application is actually up and running. For example, when when the Hello World print is printed on the on the terminal or whatever. And times that section, but let's ignore let's ignore that and just run everything from here on out in this talk. Run everything from start to finish. If you're running bigger things, might be more important to uh, define <laughs> startup as the initial phase. So I really started looking at startup in the lead up to JDK nine, uh, and well. Uh, the module system uh, that everyone uh, loves and praises these days uh, came with uh, some level of, of initial overheads. Uh, Java 9 uh, regressed, well, it wasn't too much on my workstation, but maybe from, if, you, if I saw 90 milliseconds startup times on 
startup times on Java 8, I could see them grow uh, to Java, well, in Java 9 to 110 milliseconds. You don't want to see the early access builds of Jigsaw that I started measuring, when I started measuring this, they, they were probably in like in 250, 300 millisecond range. Uh, but um, the module system itself kind of the project unfolded and folded very various things into JLink plugins and did a lot of things to cut cut away a lot of the overhead uh, before we released Java 9. But we also saw regressions in Java 9 due to you know the accumulation of features in the VM and elsewhere over three years. Uh, and this this comparison adds a few milliseconds simply due to the fact that we made G1 default and uh, uh, we added support to segment the code cache, uh, basically separate uh, C1 and C2 uh, generated code into different areas, uh, whereas previously they were intermixed. But the separation themselves added a little bit of indirection, which in nine caused uh, some methods to be become virtual methods and added a little bit of overhead there. Uh, so that various very small things adding up. Uh, JVMCI added to support uh, Graal as an experimental compiler in Java 9, adds a little bit of overhead to everyone else as well. Uh, things like that. My favorite regression was due to the uh, VM flag constraint checking that was added in Java 9. <laughs> which adds on the order of like 15 million instructions being retired uh, on every VM uh, start just to check if your if if your command line arguments are within range of the allowed numbers so that was the case when there were no command line flags at all so yeah i started there <laughs> fixing that one um and we started looking at, you know, or we kept looking at, I've been looking at optimizing Jigsaw for uh, well over a year. But for Java 10, we kept fighting the technical depth uh, that we had uh, built up in Java 9. Uh, Java, well, we uh, fixed numerous of these small library and other runtime optimizations, like the VM flag checking, cuts, cuts away, you know, my fractions of milliseconds for each each such uh, infraction um, other 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 op op other optimizations came from you know others like Thomas Schatzel doing G1 and startup and footprint improvements for for some of our big customers that help helps also the the nominal and you know early startup of of Java for everyone uh, there were, you know, improvements to CDS, starting to add uh, support for pre-resolving uh, constant pool entries and whatever. So G JDK 10 on my machine, we actually was able to uh, uh, get back to break even uh, with with Java Java 8. What was it in steps? Uh, I'm not sure. There were there were small incremental regressions. On some measures, but not not on Hello World. Mostly, most of the time, there were there were the regressions there were seen on a little bit larger things, uh, but uh, most of them were resolved during the eight uh, updates. So eight updates kind of started an improving trend as well. Uh, right. Uh, well, the project to keep improving startup kind of crept on in, uh, into into JDK 11 because well JDK 11 was slated to be a long term support release so there was still interest in keeping keeping these things rolling um, we got a little bit of you know uh, unintended help by the fact that just removing a number of modules helps uh, improve startup at least in the framework or in the context of Java 11 uh, so getting rid of uh, Java XML bind and other other uh, other couple of modules that uh, bring bring that didn't spark joy enough to uh, be kept in the JDK uh, because they can be you know in pulled in as uh, as dependencies and pro us usually you want to you know I, I don't know how many enterprise systems I've been in where where you had the dependency on J on JAXB 2.1, but your JDK of choice ships with 2.0, which someone else has a dependency on, and you have this uh, libxt path, and you know, 
all all that fun and joy that uh, that the module system wanted to get to, you know get to the bottom of and kind of succeeded but to the grief and, uh, and annoyment of lots of uh, deployers anyhow library op optimizations continued as well but didn't uh, you know we we kept a nice downward trajectory uh, i would say and we kept on digging uh for for java 12 these are slightly old slides uh, so i should probably remove the question mark in the title here uh well we kept kept improving things uh cds uh, can now serialize uh default module graphs so we are we're we're we have the facilities in place to kind of not run the Java code to do a lot of the things that we do during uh, module setup at, at all. We, we're just loading the, the result of it from the CDS archive. So we, we don't have to run, you know, uh, quite a substantial chunk of Java code during Bootstrap to set things up. And we we have a toolbox now to keep on doing that for, for a lot of the things that we are, you know, doing every time we're starting, like creating locales and character data sets, et cetera. So we can probably keep on doing that. We have a nice new tool set, even though we are not using it as extensively as we could, but uh, it's a good, good, good place to keep, keep on digging. Uh, all these numbers are with CDS, CDS uh, enabled, uh, and a new thing that might help people pulling in and, and testing on CDS on Java 12 is that CDS is now enabled by default. You don't have to go through the hoops of uh, uh, dumping or whatever. So you'll, you'll have a base archive ready set uh, that will always work. And there's been improvements to make sure that even if the CDS archive wasn't you know, generated for the exact uh, heap sizes, et cetera, because it, it modulates a little bit a few of the things, it, it kind of allows for you know, a very, very quick uh, patching of these archives into memory. So, so, it, so it, it should always be a substantial startup uh, improvement. Uh, yeah, of course, as in any, any release, there are local regressions that we are looking into. But anyhow. Uh, yeah, so another view of this is to measure the amount of bytecode that we execute uh, during startup. And uh, the number of bytecodes we execute kind of shifts depending on what kind of uh, machine we are on. If you have a machine with, uh, well, this, oh, sorry. This slide is uh, comparing uh, if you run in the interpreter only with uh, out the out of the box experience. So you'll see that uh, JIT threads quickly uh, take all the Java code that you're running during Bootstrap and runs them through JIT, optimizes them away. Uh, so we see that uh, the, the number of bytecodes uh, executed kind of shifts uh, dramatically and dynamically with each release. But yeah, let's... Uh, so, any, well, this, the, the gist of it is that in Java 9, the, the raw amount of bytecode needed to bootstrap uh, a JVM increased by 9x. Uh, and then we started, you know, cutting away at the number of raw bytecodes needed to execute uh, in, in each subsequent release. And JIT threads um, are, you know, starting faster or starting up faster in the, in the bootstrap cycle. Uh, so, so it, it uh, well, in, in the end, we execute less bytecode, even though we are doing more <laughs> in, in the bootstrap than before, before Java 8. Anyhow, uh, you'll see diff slightly different numbers maybe on, on systems, depending on how many cores, how many JIT, JIT threads you can throw at the problem of, you know, uh, optimizing away uh, otherwise interpreted Java code. Uh, for example, the top Top here is my workstation, which is a dual socket uh, workstation. Uh, it quickly uh, sees, you know, the improvements uh, from 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 nine to twelve uh, lead lead into and and you know we are we are now starting and running faster uh, than Java eight. But I don't I don't see. I kind of break even on my laptop uh, because. 
it has fewer JIT threads to to kind of leverage the the uh, the, the improvements that we've done, but they're very very even now uh, on uh, on Java 13. Anyhow, let's uh, move on to uh, lambdas and uh, well, what <laughs> we. Uh, since since Java 8, when lambdas was, were introduced, uh, we've kind of been cognizant to the fact that bootstrapping lambdas is kind of uh, heavy on the uh, on the cost on f first or initial uh, initial use. Uh, so uh, on on Java 8, if you take the simple uh, simplest uh, Java Java Lambda uh, benchmark, and and run it. You'll see that it'll have an overhead of the equivalent, you know, legacy Java code uh, that was a little bit on the heavy side. And on my workstation, I, I could see about ninety milliseconds. Uh, we started looking at that in Java nine to optimize the way a lot of the overheads of these uh, invoke dynamic. Uh, or the of the lambda meter factory uh, thing, so we we cleaned up the implementation a lot in the Open EDK. We uh, uh, I wrote wrote a Jling plugin that allows for pre-generation of some of the method handles or method yeah method handle forms uh, like link link uh, lambda forms etc. that are like the constituent uh, building blocks of uh, of some of the method handle framework uh, that is used to implement uh, Java Lang Invoke in Indy. Uh, and we could cut away like 50% of the overhead of, of, of uh, lambdas. So uh, even though then startup in general regressed in Java 9, as if your application had one or a few lambdas, you were actually improving even on 9. Uh, and we kept improving in 9 and in 10 as well. and then I realized that most of the method handle adapt adapter stuff that we did in uh, in setting up the first in initial invocation of a lambda was actually an unnecessary and an artifact that we weren't using uh, static type information in the code that called the bootstrap method. So we fixed that, got rid of another 75% of the 